friends, I'm Rick. This is your seat at the table. Got little Missy hanging around back here somewhere. Door's open, but she's choosing to stay in here with me right, right now. I don't know. So, does our confidence in the system that we are playing aid or detract or aid us in our striving for our total immersion? So, what am I saying here? Uh, there, like I said, there's a there's a hot topic going around in the role playing gamers uh, uh, circles uh, here and there. Uh, it's about this uh, four types of dim of of, of uh, four dimensions of play. First dimension being the tabletop board game, your basic, you know, like chess, uh, basic, very basic battle tech would fit in that category. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of brain power. There's plenty of questions you can you can banner about all you want. You're just moving pieces around on, and and tracking the results. Then it goes on to the second dimension. This is where we are making an effort to actually sit down and put our heads into the characters that we are representing. Uh, but we're still, it's okay to have the banter, have the questions, have the gushings that are uh, out of character, and, uh, and all the distractions that you more normally would have at a get together. The third dimension is a bit more uh, where most veteran players, people play long enough, especially role-playing game people, will have achieved third, the third dimension of immersion uh, more, than, more than a few times. It's something that you get in at the moment, everything is just clicking and we're all on the same page and it's just, you can picture the situation as if you're watching a movie. This leads us to the fourth dimension or the total immersion. This is an end goal that you strive for. That most people fall short on and I don't fault people for pursuing this level of perfection I fully understand it uh, I only I only thing I start to rail is when I start hearing them talk in such absolutes that they become an elitist whether they realize they're not and they're ready to cut the throats of everything else so all the other games that the backs from which this their fourth the dimension of immersion is based off of they're standing on top of them they want to discount them altogether now, I find that to be very uh, disingenuous at best, uh, very arrogant, you know, that's what I mean by elitist. These are not good, they are very bad people for, for wanting to uh, be the uh, uh, face of the ga gaming hobby. And they're entitled to do this. That's their thing. So, my belief in this, and I have pursued this version, a version of this my entire life. If uh, someone were to play a play-by-post that I run, you would have that level of immersion because that's the, I'm striving for a novel. I want as much detail within reason as possible that fits the character and the situation. And the beautiful thing about some of that is that you can have all your out-of-character conversations in a separate, you know, whether you're doing it through through, uh, through emails or text messages or some sort of platform that allows for multiple threads at the same time like D&D Beyond used to do or may still do. Uh, you have all your out of question or out of character questions and, and discussions in a separate format that never intrudes on the actual storyline that's being created. So the characters when they're presented are presented in such a manner as that you have full immersion of your character because you want to be able to go back and read these things like you're reading chapters in a novel and get that immersion and now I'm aware that not everybody gets that level of uh, you know uh, immersion there's a reason why the rare video I shoot from my living room and you can see the bookcase is full of books what you don't see is another bookcase that runs along the lower half of, uh, under the front window that's full of novels and then of course the one over in the corner that's full of novels and I got stacks of novels sitting here and stacks of novels sitting over there stacks of novels in the bedroom I read a lot I do I read a lot and sometimes I will read multiple things I am currently working on five different projects. I have the third book of Game of Thrones sitting on my counter or my, my nightstand. I've got three different uh, game supplements sitting in the in the uh, magazine hold rack in the bathroom. Uh, I have one out on the truck dash right now. I've got uh, Imp uh, Empire Alone sitting out on the dash of my truck. Uh, something I bought brand new from Catalyst uh, some months ago and just, just now finally broke the wrapping off of it to, to actually read it. 
then uh, then I have uh, another project I got going on out there. It's just kind of the way I multitask. So when we look at this, and I ask, uh, how how much does how much are you able to uh, do away with basic basic rules or basic roles and rule changes and requests and clarifications in a game system you're quite familiar with? Does this not aid to your immersion as getting in character and being the character, literally being in the shoes of the character you're representing? I personally believe that that plays a big role. That I think that the more you're confident with the system you're running, and more importantly, the more confidence you have in everybody else sitting around the same table as you or through the same virtual table as you, having that same basic information or more advanced information on that game system, and that comfort of familiarity allows you to know that my character should not, I should not have to request uh, a climbing check roll uh, because my, this character is sufficiently strong enough and skilled enough to make that climb at a glance. It's when things get to be really, you know, the difference between climbing uh, 10 foot to get on top of a building versus, uh, you know, climbing 100 feet up the side of a, of a sheer cliff. At some point you might want to have some, some tr rolls and some checks on that. but. In total, full total immersion, none of that occurs. They don't want anything that detracts from the game. And then there are other. Then there are some players that really they they, they don't want to know the game, the dice results. They just want to know, you know, they're looking for the bag of gold. The fun is trying to find the bag of gold, you know, through key words and just flat out. I'm sorry, man, you can't find. There, there's no bag of gold to be held. They don't need to hear the roll that that the that the the, the GM made to see if the, they were, their search was successful or not. So we look at some of this, does our confidence in the system we are playing aid in our striving for total immersion? You know, character's judgment versus player judgment. This is a tricky thing if you think about that. When you put yourself in the role of a character, you have to suspend your personal beliefs, your personal uh, uh, foilables, and, and your knowledge of what you know you can and can't do and replace it with what the character says, she says your character is supposed to be able to do. And how confident are you in the, your ability to recognize that? That plays its role in how deep you can immerse yourself or if you find yourself stumbling over something and needing you know, a, 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 a spell check or a roll check or something. This links us to the number two point on this, this, this uh, rant or what, tirade or whatever the hell you want to call it. Basic common sense based on your character stats versus roles. Back again, it, the more you want to immerse yourself in the game, the less distractions you want from the outside, which includes making those dice rolls on a regular basis. You don't want to make any dice rolls at all. And total immersion on the fourth dimension of or, uh, fourth level of, of total immersion, there would be no dice rolls whatsoever. There's no request for dice rolls, and there should be no hesitation. That too is a trick. Because some people hesitate out of habit, you know. You just need to figure out how to coach your in, in character kind of, ha you know. You know uh, Joe, my character is Bob. Bob looks over, you know, Bob, the, the, the mechanics, looking over at the ship systems board to make sure that everything's running. You know, like checking the lights and the readings and things to make sure everything's running in parameters. That's giving my head a chance to figure out how to respond to the, the, the current situation or, or something or so and so. This leads me to one of my personal uh, foilables or personal quirks. I absolutely loathe first person. I do not like playing in first person. I am not my character. I will never presume to speak for my character directly. I have, as a novel reader, I love I love novels, but I've picked up some novels by some credible authors that would be a novel I would want to read, and I get into the first three or four pages, and it's an I book. I saw this, I did this, I went out the room, I got the car, I pulled the knife out. I, I don't want to read that. I don't want to hear that. That is not my idea of a good day. Well, there are other players that are completely believing the opposite. And they want that I because I'm, I'm literally the character. So I would do this as the character. And I get that. And there would be, there thus would be the the immovable wall meets meets the other immovable wall. There, there's no, there's nothing going to bridge that gap because I could not sit at a table, uh, unless we're talking a very casual setting, to do uh, any kind of immersion stuff on a regular basis. I, 
ate all my Cheetos, right? Anyway, so, brings the second, you know, so once again, common sense based on your character stats versus rules. So what that implies is you're comfortable enough in understanding how the stats work, how they're applied in combat or in any other given situation, how the numbers skew themselves, and how your character's numbers are situated. Meaning that thus, if I want to climb that proverbial wall and I know that my character has a, 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 a 17 strength and has an agility bonus and has a climbing skill that's pretty robust, I should have absolutely trouble climbing, you know, a 30 foot wall. That means I don't, I'm a confident my character would make that without the need to make that random roll. Because that's what the random roll does, is, is that no matter how good your character is, there's always that one, there's always that tiny percent chance of failure. And you want that in, in, in most games. But in this total immersion, the theater of the mind, that is a distraction. And you're trying to avoid those. Perhaps those are, you know, if you know ahead of time, you could just make some specific rolls in advance and drop them down. And then you could just tick them off as you go down. And you always know if you're, you're successful or not because you pre-rolled a dozen or 20, time, 20 different times for whatever. Uh, or you have the OOC channel, which you can do this. This is like I said, so play by post has got a lot of advantages that you know, play in person does not. And, and when it comes to having total immersion, you want a, a, a theater of the mind, right? Do a play by post in storyline format. At the end of the day, you will have a literal novel that you can read and go back from the start and read and get into the character, get into the scenario, get into the scene, get into the action in the theater of the mind. But that's not how these people are, are pursuing. Honest reactions and actions from the character versus player wishes versus unintentional drama. Let me repeat this. Honest reactions and actions from the character versus the player, player's wishes versus the unintentional drama. So. Some people intentionally love drama, and they bring up drama every chance they get. Uh, I bring a lot of drama sometimes, and I don't mean to, and that's because my personal life and my issues of personal life intrudes on that, and I, and I, I try to check that, and sometimes I, I fail at. When we look at it from the perspective of the player versus the character, sometimes the character's wants and wishes are not well defined at the beginning, and they come out over time. As your character grows and develops, as you play that character, as you develop that character, that character develops inside of you. So you get a better, fuller, deeper understanding. This is when I, one of those, some people have a knack for just pulling. You can, you can throw any random character at them. They read what they read on, and then they come back and pull off that character almost flawlessly. Not everybody, and once again, most people are not capable of that on a regular basis. We all have our moments, but most people are, that's a work and effort. And, and familiarity of what you're, you know, the character. So just getting you know, cold turkey, a new character, and trying to act like it's, you're, it's an old chum, it's, it's, t it's tough, and it can show. So your wishes as a player are different from your character's wishes as a character in the setting that they're in. At what point can you separate them from your person, you know, from, and understand your character's needs while you're in character with the theater mind, surmount, surmount anything you personally want to see achieve. And how do we avoid unintentional drama? One of the, the, down, the tricky parts of theater of the mind play, a fourth dimension play, is tr to avoid over exaggerating to be entertaining, to over -drama -drama uh, dramatize something, uh, to avoid being campy or over the top, which can be a distraction to other players outside. And when we think about the total immersion of theater of the mind, if you all do a, a tabletop game with that total immersion, by rights, you're, you're, if it's done well, then your viewers would also share a form of that immersion because then they can see the smooth, they hear, the, they hear and see the actions and the smooth interplay and can be drawn into the story without disruption. That would be the ultimate, the ultimate uh, plateau for theater of the mind, in my opinion. Just remember, all this is just based on my opinion. So it, it can be a bit tough to avoid bringing unnecessary uh, drama or unnecessary uh, uh, action to the scene to avoid trying to just do it to be 
the better writer, to be the more the better character, to do that to entertain the other people at the table. It's a trick. And some people can master it, and some people don't. And some people, a lot of people do it and don't re realize they're doing it. So we move on to the next, uh, next uh, bullet point. As the GM, how often do we circumvent the system because of player character immersion? This is an important thing to consider, and I think this happens far more often in fourth dimensional play when we talk theater of the mind than it would in any other stage of gaming in general. This is where the, ga the, 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 the tone and the tone of the room sets the bar. And when everybody's fully immersed, the characters are all fully immersed, and the and the, the storyteller, the GM, is too. So the they're 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 the 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 GM's goal is to is to shape the environment that the players are going to interact in. The player characters are going to do their thing in, but not completely dominate it, which is also hard to do. Uh, a a lot more of the characters' actions. And, and inactions make a bigger impact on fourth dimensional play than it would on the lower on the lower scale of things because uh, there's a lot of assumptions and givens that are taken uh, that are taken as part of a, a, a grain of salt when you initiate the, the the theater of mind style of play. The the idea that you don't want to disrupt that flow from the GM's perspective, the game master sitting back or the storyteller sitting back and going, you know they really need to make a roll here. They really need to make a piloting check to see if they actually achieve this or they don't just nosedive into that mountain over there. So I'm just going to say that they succeeded. So I don't have to roll and I don't have to disrupt the storyline. If you have a group of really talented, dedicated, theater of the mind sort of players, you can get away with that. Even then, they will be challenged in, in many ways to not take advantage of the, the obvious uh, uh, opportunities that were there to just concoct something that fits their narrative. Now, and in part being just overly dramatic. So in some cases, it's like uh, you're you're doing you're doing a shadow run uh, a shadow run campaign, and you find yourself in a da in a Dutch, and you need some assistance. And one of the, you know one of your characters goes, you know, I got an Uncle Fred. He just lives around the corner. He's loaded. Did you have an Uncle Fred? Does he live just around the corner, and is he loaded? But did you get the right to just decide that? So now you're going to, you know, inadvertently add, uh, add your own Monty Hall opportunity to the game uh, sans the, uh, the, the game master and the storyteller without letting them know in advance? Uh, are they going to go for that? Are they going to be upset about that? Are you screwing with their immersion? I, I, I have a way to answer any of that stuff, but it's a legitimate, some legitimate consideration to, con, you know, when we're talking this stuff, right? And I'm babbling on that. So we come back to the, do we over time unintentionally marginalize rules and types of rules of applications for exped, expediency? What do I mean by that? One of the earliest mechanics in tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons Dragons that gets chucked to the side is encumbrance. Encumbrance and exertion, things like daily travel. So we just, oh, you left the village, you left the town where the inn's at, boom, the next day. You traveled three weeks, you know, three days through the wilderness, boom, here you're at the, you're at the, the goblin's lair. So we just eliminated three days of travel time. We avoided all the unnecessary or uh, unnecessary seeming encounters that may have happened along the way. We also eliminate any options or any kind of game options for immersion because you're you really are passing by on things. Three days of travel, three days worth of consumables used up, and water, food, things like that. Three days of possible encounters that might have been better or worse than your encounters with the, you know, the, the goblins and the, their their hideout. So, it's a judgment call, but it's it's something that does play its role. And and then we have this bad habit of carrying over. So as a story master, as a storyteller, the, the game master, we understand the basics of how this rules would work, and we look at how they're playing, and we go, I don't want to. They really need once again. They really need to be making some rolls here. Because how do, how do we fairly decide whether they succeed or fail? Because rarely are players going to, to concoct a failure on purpose. Everything's going to succeed at some, at some marginal level or some spectacular level. Because nobody wants to lose. And how do you engineer, you know, you're climbing that 100-foot sheer cliff wall and you get halfway up 
and you and you decide your character sneezes and falls off and has to scramble madly to get uh, get a grip halfway down before you know taking five five uh, five five levels of freaking uh, fall damage you know 50 feet of fall damage is pretty bad for some characters could be lethal for most uh, could be definitely lethal if you're playing in a game I'm running and I got my you know my crit my crit charts because I'll find out if you you not only fell you broke your back now what you're not dead so you ain't gonna be doing nothing anytime soon except complain about the pain and beg for somebody else to help you and maybe maybe I don't know something right just because I'm because I'm an asshole when it comes to GM sometimes depends on what one again depends on the level of immersion you really want to play in so you still bring that around full circle what do you think how do you go into that you know so when is it okay even desirable for the game master to make roles for your cape character keeping keeping the results unseen you know for, for example players wish do not wish to know uh, they want to do a search but they don't want to know the results they, they just want to have the fun of doing this of doing the search when you the more immersive the game gets the more you everybody dials into that story the less those interactions you want to take and in some cases you can't or you will break the immersion are we cheating at this point are we just doing lip service to all the mechanics and rules that were set down by a whole lot of people over time with a lot of hard work to help guide our way through something at this point we can say we're divorcing ourselves from the mechanics of the rules and using the mechanics of common sense based off of what we know our characters should be able to do with the stats abilities and things that we have listed on our paper an ideal the game master is going to be able to look at their copy of your character sheet and agree with that and not have any kind of contention because any of that kind of contention can can screw with the air of the mind can screw with the full immersion it can also lead to some bad blood which can also skew, skew your full immersion it's a challenge it's a worthy goal to pursue and and those are people who to manage to pull it off session after session after session awesome great for you good for you still all this is pertinent question how often do you just as a game master the dungeon master the, the coordinator whatever how often do you choose to suspend rules just to make the game simpler for the people because the situation doesn't seem to warrant it or it would be too degrading to the immersion it would definitely throw a wrench into the immersion to do so is it the right thing to do and once again that's up to you and the player and the game master and everybody who's on the same table as long as everybody's on the same table because it, people can get upset at some of the minorest things and it, I've seen it I've, I've, I've been participated I've been guilty of it you know it's just kind of one of those what do you do how do you do it so anyway I just thought I would talk about it ask some questions and, and got, at least get somebody thinking think a little bit of what I'm saying about how much does it take to really generate that full level of immersion that many people are striving for and what are you willing to suspend from the game system to do this how much confidence in the system you're playing your understanding of how it works and your confidence in the people that are surrounding you at the table whether it's the storyteller or fellow players because if you can reach a certain level of total immersion the theory of mind that fourth dimension of play by rights you really don't need a, a game master at all because everybody at this point are quite confident in the rules how they work what the limitations those rules stipulate for their character without needing to make a, a, a basic a base role and then the confidence that everybody else sharing the table has that same confidence that you do too because sometimes you can sit there and have somebody pull off something you're thinking you're looking sideways at the other fill at the table going I don't think that's gonna happen but it, yet it happens because it, not allowing it disrupts the flow disrupts the immersion causes a problem so we've been too much too too much either way the tree's still gonna break at some point or maybe it won't maybe it's made out of rubber and that's all it does flip flop back and forth like some of the politicians in Washington like to do you have to, we have to make those points and ask those questions it's 
the more experience, I, I, it's my opinion, the more you play the system, the more confident you are in it. And the more you play together with the same group of people, the more confident you are in how they're going to respond to a given situation and their level of comfort in, in, the, in the game world immersion-wise. And by knowing that, we can avoid stomping on toes and hurting people's feelings, even though that's likely to still happen anyway. So give us some thought, or ignore the video altogether. I don't care. Uh, I just wanted to get this off on my get it off on here and to share my insights or what my questions or my rambling babble, however you want to look at it. Uh, anyway, so I'm Rick. Let's see you back here somewhere. Till next time. You guys have yourself a great weekend. It just irritates me.